perspective and put some things in perspective. My understanding, is unless in the last couple of minutes, uh, uh, Israel still has not voted in the new, or inaugurated the new government. And so, here we are. Hallelujah. They're supposed to have done it, you know, at uh, 9 o'clock our time this morning. But they're arguing over this, that, and the other. And it only takes one vote to change the whole shebang. So it's up in the air right at this very moment, still. So I want to put a couple of things kind of in order for us. And, uh, and, and then I, I, will, I will teach what the Lord has given. I want to remind you about the ancient book of Enoch. We did a sweeping kind of an overview of, of that book on a Monday or Thursday night. And I'm sure it's still on archives or wherever. But there, there are a few little things I want to say to you about it. One is, and it was God's first prophet. He was the first one raptured. And he will be one of the witnesses that comes back. And, you know, he was taken up to heaven to walk with the Lord and is there in bodily form. Amen. Only two people are there, Elijah and Enoch. And so the book that he wrote uh, obviously is one that we want to pay attention to as God's first prophet. <laughs> and so there's several things in the particular book that was done uh, by Ken Johnson so many years ago. Let me remind you of just some of the things pertaining to it. A statement was made. It's obvious that the book of Enoch was not supposed to be placed into the canon of scripture, but kept as a special message to those who lived in the generation just prior to the tribulation period. That would be us. That would be the raptured ones, the ones that would go up. The end of the end, as the Lord spoke it, you're now the end of the end of the end of the end. Right. Amen. Time disciples. The last of the last. And in a moment, in a time, the very last person, think about it, to enter heaven or receive salvation during this, if we want to call it dispensation, I hate to use that word, but anyway, during this season, that person, we're in a season that that's going to happen. Now you have to remember that there was, even when we are getting ready to cross the Red Sea, they had to wait for everyone to die, for everyone except two to die. Joshua and Caleb. And on a certain day, the last one died. And when the last one died, then things changed. The same will be as we live in this time frame waiting to be taken up. There will be a time be it right now, in this season, I'll assure you it is right now. That somebody, somewhere, because the twinkling of an eye is going to take place. Amen. And in that moment, there will be someone, will be the last, to come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ during this season. Sometimes we forget those kinds of things. And, and we need to, to be reminded. Let me take you back through some things because I want to clear up some things. Some of the things that, that Enoch said, he says, in those days I saw the Ancient of Days seated upon his throne of glory and the books of the living were opened before him and all his hosts which is in heaven above stood before him. The hearts of the holy ones were filled with joy because the number of the righteous was fulfilled. 
and the prayer of the righteous had been heard and the blood of the righteous one had been required before the Lord of Spirits. Then will pain come upon them as a woman in travail in a hard birth. Talking about the second coming or the coming of the Lord. When her child enters the mouth of the womb and she has pain in giving birth, the righteous and the elect will be saved on that day and they will never again see the face of the sinners and the unrighteous. The Lord of spirits will abide with them and with the Son of Man will they eat, lie down, and rise up with him forever. The righteous and the elect will rise from the earth and cease to be of downcast countenance and they will be clothed with garments of eternal life. These will be the garments of life from the Lord of spirits, and your garments will not grow old, nor your glory pass away before the Lord of spirits. Now, this, this is all written before Noah, before Lot, before all of those times. We're talking almost now 6,000 years ago. He said, I watch the next 23 shepherds, talking about the 59 shepherds. 58 shepherds. I watched the next 23 shepherds pastured, but when they completed their periods, they had pastured 58 times. And in parentheses has, this is Brother Ken interpreting it, the gospel age will close when these are complete. So when the 59th shepherd of Israel, Enoch only saw 58, Eight shepherds. Netanyahu is 58. Whomever is being voted on now, it doesn't matter the name. It doesn't matter who it is. They will be 59. And that was not seen as almost like being illegitimate from heaven's point of view. Love righteousness and walk in it. Do not approach righteousness with a double heart and associate not with those of a double heart. But walk in justice, my sons. It will guide you on good paths and righteousness will be your companion. The righteous will arise from their sleep, the resurrection, and wisdom will arise and be given unto them. For the holy God, the great one, has appointed days for all things. The righteous one will arise from sleep. He will awake and walk in the paths of righteousness and all his paths and ways will be eternal goodness and grace. Be hopeful, you righteous, for the sinners will suddenly perish before you and you will have lordship over them according to your desires. In the day of the tribulation of the sinners, your children will mount and rise as eagles. And higher than the hawk's nest, you will ascend. The sinners will enter the crevices of the earth and the clefts of the rock forever. The unrighteous will cry because of you and weep like sirens. Fear not, you who have suffered for healing will be your portion. And a bright light will enlighten you. And the voice of rest you will hear from heaven. Glory to the Lord God Almighty. I swear unto you, you righteous, that in heaven the angels record your goodness and your names are written before the glory of the Great One. Since this joy will be yours, you will not have to hide on the day of the great judgment because you will not be found as sinners. And the eternal judgment will be far from you for all the generations of the world. So fear not, you righteous, when you see the sinners growing strong and prospering in their ways. Do not be companions with them, but keep far from their violence, for you will become companions of the host of heaven. Amen. Now, there are many more things I could have addressed from there, but I wanted to give honor unto Enoch as the first prophet of God and is one that should be paid attention to and that we should heed what he has said. 
Now let me come back and address to you this major prophetic event that is happening right now. Supposedly at 4 o'clock today, Israel's time, 9 o'clock this morning, our time, the 59th, as I said earlier, prime minister or shepherd was to be installed, or is in the process of whatever. Pardon? They're still fighting. They're still fighting. Uh, and sound familiar, but anyway. Uh, so, uh, to be installed as the 59th administration. And you need to remember that word. 59th administration would be put in place. Now, I've been telling you that we could not be here for the 50 nights, and I believe that's true. So let me explain. But when this happened, or is happening as it appears to be happening, <laughs> who knows whether it's going to happen or not? If it does not happen today, it will happen. Uh, uh, something not far away, very quickly, it's going to happen because it falls, you fig tree generation. And those of you who took the time to listen possibly to it again or to understand all that was given about the times and the dates, the times of, of the Lord and, and how uh, he gave those times and uh, the season of life itself and talking about the nation of Israel and Israel now being 73 years old and would not actually live past in, in terms of looking at it from the, that prophetic uh, uh, word and insight past 80 years where there's seven years of tribulation that have to take place. So we know something has to happen and must happen very, very quickly. Now, so no matter whether it happens at this moment, do I know for absolute, for certain, that if it happens at this moment that you and I will be here or we would be taken out of the church this morning? No, I don't know that answer. It could happen. But I'm going to give you what I believe is a word from the Lord and what I believe about it. When I first heard it, that it was going to be voted on this morning, was on Friday. And I thought, oh my Lord. And my heart, <gasps> uh, it kind of snuck up on us. They did some things on Tuesday and did some things on Friday and they were supposed to vote this morning. I'm thinking I got 10 to 14 days. I mean, what good is 10 to 14 days? Come on, Jesus is coming. But anyway, and to find out that no, you've got two days possibly. And so I went to the Lord about this and he and I had long talks about it. I had interpreted Enoch's vision and, and I'm just saying, I've always been honest with you, so I'm going to be as honest as I know how to be with you. I had interpreted that in, in its vision, we could not be here for an inauguration that is supposed to be happening today. Again, I thought by the time I came to church, it would have already happened. I had no idea that by the time I'm preaching, it still hadn't happened. So... I'm putting these little notes together thinking it has happened. As I say, I've always tried to be as honest as I could. I do not believe we will be here in their 59th administration as it goes into, uh, I've tried to find the right word, and to work as it begins to function. Yes, I do not believe that. I do not believe we will see that happen. Uh, but I do believe that the way I saw it the first go around and my interpretation was very narrow thinking that 
when they did what would be called an inauguration, whenever they do it today, or whether they don't, again, it's going to happen. And it's going to happen some point very, very quickly because, again, go back to the fig tree yeah. generation. I explained that in detail. Now, the Lord reminded me that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, a thing is established. And I believe that, I believe very strongly in Enoch's prophets and visions. But I also believe just as strongly what Jesus said, more so, of course, what Jesus said. And it was as it was in the days of Noah, yes. as it was in the days of Lot. And we are certainly living in those days. There's no question about it. And we are definitely the fig tree generation. There is no question about any of that. So I urge you with everything that you can possibly grab hold of to think of all the clues and hold on to them and to stay ready for the return of the Lord. I'm going to still be looking for him because there's still another clue. And we talked about it in the fig tree generation. And it has to do with what would happen before summer. And that is a legitimate clue. Now, summer for us is Sunday, Father's Day. For Israel, it's because of the time frame, is Monday. So the 20th, next Sunday, is summer for us. 21st is summer for Israel, again, because of the time frame. Now, I would never try to mislead anyone. I think you know that, especially my congregation. So I want you to give me a little grace here because I said it's, we could not be here for an administration to come in. I did say all that. I just didn't understand everything. That it wasn't the moment of somebody being placed in the office. It had to do with that administration being in operation. Okay. Now, uh, we have to pay attention to what Paul said, what Jesus said, what they all wrote, what Revelation, what all Scripture says. And we do see in part and prophesy in part. All of that really doesn't change anything. Everything I've said to you doesn't really change anything about where we are, except the interpretation of the meaning of inauguration. That's the only thing that's changed. Are you with me? Yes. Now, if you're not, you need to let me clarify myself, because I don't want to confuse anybody. I thought that the moment they were inaugurated, for instance, I thought at 9 o'clock this morning, our time, we couldn't be here. We wouldn't even be here for church. And I now understand very clearly, even though, let me say this, the Lord does what the Lord wants to do. But they're not inaugurated yet. I mean, even that hadn't happened yet. And it's a few minutes to 12 here. So it's still, you know, it's about a quarter minute. 20, I've got a clock. You don't have to look at yours. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, but it doesn't change anything again except the meaning of inauguration. And so I, what, it, what we say is that my assumption that we would be gone, as I said, the moment that inauguration took place. But that's not what the Lord said was the complete meaning of it. It's when that inauguration period, are you with me? Based on what Enoch said. Now, how, how long is that inauguration period before they begin to change everything? I don't know, but I do know what Jesus said pertaining to summer. Right. So, there's not any reason in the world. It's, this is the most important week probably you and I have ever lived. 
because truthfully, Jesus could come at any moment. I don't know how long an inauguration period is. Neither do you. But I'm telling you, I, this is probably the most important week of, of any time in our life. We need to stay awake. You need to be ready to fly. And it's not the sweet by and by. It's the here and now. You need to be ready. You need to be ready. And is this the last Sunday that as a church we will meet here? I don't know. Certainly could be. I have no idea. So uh, we are in a daily walk right now. Amen. Is it going to be one day? Two days? Three days? But I'm telling you it's humongous what's happening in Israel. If you believe that in it is God's anointed first prophet, first raptured witness to come. And you put credence in what he has said. Hallelujah. Take a deep breath. <laughs> oh, glory to God. We're about to go up. We're about to see him as he is. We're about to behold him. So, were you ready? Yeah. All right. All right. I want to talk to you today then. Did that clear up anything? Did that help you? Yes. Again, I can only, the Lord kept saying, well, you know, it could be a day. It could be two days. It could be three days. But there is another sign. And it is the summer sign. Now the question comes is, when is Lord's su summer compared to our time? Because he doesn't operate on ours. But you cannot do away with the fact that Israel is 73, and you cannot do away with what was taught with the fig tree generation. You have to put it all together. Seven years of tribulation has to come. So, I want to talk to you then about the finish line is on the horizon. Glory to God. And then I realized, and the Lord said, everybody doesn't even know what a horizon is. You know, we think they do. But in this day and age, when people are not even educated correctly, they don't always know. It's the line that separates the earth from the sky. I could say the line that separates earth from heaven. It's the line where it appears that earth and the sky or earth and heaven meet. The finish line is on the horizon. Now, wars, you know this, wars are, are fought, wars are, 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 are uh, waged under the leadership of army commanders who study what's happening with the other army. We study what's going on, the enemy's tactics and their plans and all this, that, and the other. And so the church really should be studying uh, all the signs and we should be prepared for spiritual battles and things that are happening. There have been strong spiritual battles going on and let me commend the church and those who have prayed. I mean, immediately there was a huge drug burst uh, bust that, that happened here in Richmond County uh, last week. It was humongous. Yes. Glory. Keep praying on the assignment that the Lord gave us. Yes. The assignment. So, so the enemy knows he cannot stop the rapture. Right. He knows that. 
But he's doing everything to distract us or to weaken us or, or to make us think this didn't work or, or see there, nothing is right. None of the dates are right or nothing ever happens. And I want to say this, things are not the way they appear. Amen. What you see, you are not really seeing. And who you think you're looking at, you're not looking at them. I'm just telling you up front, and it's the flat truth. Good old Georgia term. I'm just telling you, they're, it's not the way things appear to be, not at all. And things are happening, and everything that we said pay attention to has, is in the works or in the making or has happened or whatever. Just because you hadn't heard about it doesn't mean dooley squat. That's right. That's right. Hello. You know, some things the Lord says, hold off on. Doesn't mean it hadn't happened. Now, we know the devil's a loser. And, uh, and you know that the word warns you about his stupid, idiotic schemes that he does all the time. We should be aware then in these days, and actually you should be aware all of our days, how you and I are called to live in victory because that's our mandate. Grow up the body of Christ and teach them victory. That's our mandate. The writer of Hebrews gave us three basic instructions. Number one, strip off all the weights. Number two, run the race. Number three, focus and keep your eyes on Jesus. Let's look at Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, that's us now, church. We are surrounded by such a huge cloud of witnesses. And who are the cloud of witnesses? Those who've gone on before of us. Those who are witnesses to the goodness of God and the grace of God. Those who went to heaven. Yes. Such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who uh, initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Hallelujah. Now, think of all the hostility he endured. Talking about Jesus. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and you won't give up. Amen. Now, let, let's take this kind of, this is a now for right now message. You got it? Amen. So let's take this little phrase by phrase. It says that we are surrounded by a huge host or a great cloud of witnesses. And the thing I want you to pay attention to, and you know, the Lord is so funny that you want to pay attention to is this. It's a cloud of witnesses, not a cloud of spectators. All right. See, a, specta a spectator is an observer. The church is filled with spectators, actually, and uh, a bystander, a person who watches something without taking any active part whatsoever in what's going on. That's a spectator. I mean, they carry on from home, they carry on from their lounge chair. They carry on from their sofa. Spectators do. You know, they have, uh, if there's a football team they're interested in, they yell and scream and carry on at home and say all kind of words to the TV. You know, as they sit back in their recliner. But they themselves are not involved. They're not involved. They have particular characteristics, all spectators. They always think the coach could have done a better job. Mm -hmm. They yell at the players as if the players can hear them. Well. You know, they have their field where they shoulda and coulda. They should have done this, they couldn't. I mean, they just carry on. You know how you do. You know how we do. And they, they just, you know, they sit there and they carry on, they munch on well, and they drink, well, <laughs> of course, I'm talking to the church. So they drink tea or they drink 
socks, uh, you know, sodas, or yeah. whatever. I'm talking to the church. Amen. I'm not talking to those who watch a game and become intoxicated. I mean, this is a message for the church. <laughs> See, at a football game, there's a big crowd of spectators, but very few participants. That describes the church. The spectators watch, but they're not involved. They critique the, passage, the pastor's message, for instance, instead of implying it, applying it to themselves. They talk about, you know, she said this, she said that. I don't know, I believe this, I believe that. But they don't, they don't take it home and do anything about it. Well. It's not for them. They just like to talk about it. Well. But they don't want to change them. They have no, no need to change as far as they're concerned. They, they should, you know, they say, she could have said this this way. Or she ought to have said this this way. She should never have been so specific about a date. Guess what? I'm being specific again about a date. You're not going to shut me up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Spectators have no shortage of opinion on every single thing that's going on. And in the social media, they'd like to tell everybody what they think. And they, some way, they feel like the whole world needs to hear their opinions. Well. <laughs> Where in the world did we get that? It's okay to have an opinion, but keep it to yourself sometimes. I mean, you know you don't know half of what you're talking about. <laughs> and you also know you don't have all the information. <laughs> but you left just a right. on everybody. You're left just to act like God himself well, speaking about what you know and you only know who somebody told you who told them, who told them, who told them, who told them. And by that time, monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> At that point in time. See, because unless you're in the game, yes. your opinion doesn't matter to a hill of beans. It's irrelevant. And on top of all of it, nobody asks you. How many times have you seen the coach in the middle of a football game run off and go up into the stands and ask somebody's opinion? I mean, the players are not listening to your shouts no matter how loud you are or how drunk you are. Or what kind of a fool you make of yourself. They're listening to the coach. Hello, church. And the foolproof way to know if you're a spectator or if you are a participant is to listen to yourself at lunch after the service. Well, we know you're a spectator because you don't say nothing about nothing except pass the potatoes. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, the text in Hebrews does not say, since we're surrounded by a huge cloud of spectators, where there's an opinion as they are from everybody, let's listen to them. It doesn't say that at all. You are surrounded by a, cl a great cloud of witnesses. People particularly, if they have ever been corrected on anything, they really begin to be what they think are the most uh, knowledgeable of what could have done, should have done, or how it really happened. Or, you know, they also become people also who twist things a whole bunch. You know, the church has lost integrity. Amen. For those two or three amens, God bless you. Integrity. Don't stretch it. You don't lie. You don't try to Cut out, make an excuse for your behavior. You face up. You know, I didn't have to say anything this morning about what I'd said. About it. I could have just come in here and said, well, turn to Hebrews. But I was burdened by how I could help you understand. And if possibly I had misled somebody. 
And I was burdened by the fact that, Lord, please do not let them all of a sudden begin to think, this is not about to happen. I was crying out to the Lord. Because I know Jesus is coming. I know what my mandate is. You matter to me. You matter to me. Those who are watching. It matters that as many people as possible can be made ready for the coming of the Lord. I don't want you to be caught off guard. I don't want you to say, I wish somebody had told me. We're about to meet him. We're about to meet him. It's the truth. Oh, you've been saying it for years. Oh, yeah. But things have changed. Mm -mm -mm. The nearness of the Lord. My goodness. There are far more people in this sanctuary right now than most of you possibly even know. Or some of you won't even let your minds go there. They're not, you know, being spectators this morning. There are witnesses all over this sanctuary. Far more than what you see. Isn't it sad that we're so limited? Yeah. Isn't it so sad that if we can't see it and we can't touch it and we can't taste it, we don't believe it? Well. Oh, they're here. They're here. They're our brothers and they're our sisters, our friends, our neighbors, our husbands, our wives. They're here. Our mamas, our daddies. Grandmamas and granddaddies, great grandmamas, great, 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 great. They're here. Those who knew the Lord are here. They're still hungry for the things of God through all eternity. But they're here. They're here. They're the people who didn't quit when they were discouraged. They didn't quit when they were persecuted. They didn't quit when it was hard and money was scarce. They didn't quit. They didn't quit when they were hungry. They didn't quit when they were tired. They didn't quit when they were disappointed. They didn't quit when somebody looked at them wrong, when somebody said something about them. They didn't quit when they were uh, criticized. They didn't quit when they were exhausted. They didn't quit. Amen. They're here. They held on to the truth of the gospel they held on believing that Jesus is the Lord of their life. They believe he is the Son of God. They ask him into their heart. They held on to that. Yes. I mean, when we get to heaven, everybody's not, I mean, you know, you don't have somebody who served God all their life and somebody who came in, you know, with their behind burned. That's a loose interpretation in Corinthians. Some of you are looking at me, did she just say what I thought she said? I did. I did, I said it. The scripture actually basically says that. They just sneak right in. I was one of those. I was one of those when, when I, you know, ignorant. I'm still ignorant. Don't misunderstand me. There's still ignorance to a certain degree. Yes, I am. We all are. Ignorant, you're ignorant to a certain degree. We're growing daily in the knowledge of the Lord. But back when I was really ignorant, ignorant, I just wanted to be happy enough to just let me get in. And if I'm singed when I go in, just let me get in the door. And I used to say, Lord, if I'm sitting so far back that I need binoculars to see her, see on the stage, just let me get in. Anybody ever been there? I had no idea what I was talking about. It sounded so holy, didn't it? That is dumb. And if you're there, that is dumb, dumb. The Lord is calling us to come forth. He holds out the greatest thing for all of us. For all of us. You know, religion and tradition can sink the ship. And you can think you're holy. And you are full of them. <laughs> now, if you could hear what that cloud of witnesses were saying right now, they'd be saying something like, it's worth it. Jesus is wonderful. Come on in. Come on down. Get ready. I mean, they would say, I mean, 
The love of the Lord is beyond description. He is gracious. He is glorious. He's magnificent. The glorious, redeeming love of God Almighty. He knows you by name. He's not mad with you. He cares about you. Come on home. Amen. It's worth it all. Yes. Look at your neighbor and say, it's worth it all. Yes. We're talking about knowing Jesus, serving Jesus. It's worth it all. Yes. It's worth it all. And I can hear them say, don't let distractions steal your hope. I've never seen so many distractions in all of my days. Amen. As in these days right now. Yes. See, the devil doesn't want you to believe that he could actually come. Right. Before you get home. Right. Or possibly we may not ever meet again in this sanctuary until the millennial. Oh, you don't really believe that, do you? My heart was going pretty bad when I thought the other day, dear God, he's coming. I want him to come, but dear God, he's coming. Do you understand? My Lord, he's coming. Oh, come Lord Jesus. Oh, Jesus is coming. I mean, you know how you do? You know how you do? He said, don't let disappointment steal your faith. Amen. Don't let emotions steal your love for the Lord. Amen. And don't let irritation steal your love for the brethren. Amen. Endurance and patience is what will keep you on your feet in these days that we're living in. You'll do like Jesus. You'll look beyond the pain, the frustration, the weariness, and you'll focus your eyes on the goal the eternal life of perfect love that you and I will live forever with Jesus. And get over the thing. He won't even know I'm there. Oh, yeah, honey, you can't get there without him. He'll know you're there. Now, how is he going to know all of us and love all? I don't know. But he's going to do it. How does he hear you and hear me and hear all of us at one time? I don't know. He's God. He's God. Hebrews 12, 2 says, We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he knew what he was capturing. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is sitting in the place of honor beside God's throne. He knew what was happening and yet, he saw beyond it. Can, can you process this better than I can? He saw you. He endured the pain. He saw you. You. And wanted you. And wanted you. Now, you and I are here... I hope you're not here because you don't have anything else to do. <laughs> At least I hope that's not why you're here. I believe you're here to be strengthened, to be mobilized, energized, trained, equipped to turn this city upside down because that's our mandate. Amen. And we must do it in these days that we have. We, we keep doing it. We occupy till he comes. Yes. And the cloud of witnesses is saying, we did it. It's now your time to do it. Keep on keeping on. Amen. To the very last, until you hear the trumpet. Yes. Until you hear Gabriel shout. Yes. And God Almighty, we're talking about the Father, Amen. blowing that trumpet. Wow. A shout. Dead in Christ will rise. Trumpet sound will come. They'll go and we'll go and wham. Only those who are looking for him, we're out of here. Whoa. And the world is, whoo. The aliens got them. That's what they're going to say. They're going to say, thank God all them bad folks are gone. The aliens took them away. Glory to God. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. Oh. 
Oh, my word, I'm telling you, something just happened in this place. Something just happened in this place. Whoa, I don't know what it is, but something just happened. Whoa, something just happened. Whoa, the entire atmosphere totally changed. Whoa. Wow, something happened. Whoa. Wow. Something happened. Pile of people just came in here and all other kind of th- I'm, something just happened. Come on, fig tree generation. This is your time. The finish line's on the horizon. Keep on keeping on. Don't you stop running. Something just happened. Whoa. Yeah. Second Corinthians four seventeen. For our present troubles are small and won't last very, oh, very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. See, it's no secret that many Christians are growing weary and faint-hearted. We need to hear what the writer says in Hebrews 12, 1. Whoa. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. That's a good one too, but anyway. (laughs) Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Especially the sin that so easily trips us up and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Amen. Glory to God. Strip it off like you would take varnish off an old piece of furniture. Amen. It takes persistence. It takes patience for you to endure to the end. Amen. Now in a congregation like this one, I don't need to be telling y'all not to be murdering anybody, I don't think. <laughs> or don't steal from your neighbor or shack up with your neighbor's wife. Or when, whoever your neighbor has. <laughs> I'm something is. <laughs> so, what kind of weights do you need to strip off? There are three particular kinds. The weight of comparisons. My race is not your race. Buster's race is not Horace's race. Sally's not Sue's race. We all have our own race uniquely designed by God for you to run your race. And to be jealous of somebody else's race reveals an immature and self-centered heart. You need to spend your time worrying about you. And if ever you were worried about you, I suggest you do it now. You don't have much time to worry and think on you. So if you're hung up on you, this is a good time to think about it and get it straight. Because Jesus is coming. And you need to get over you. Right. You need to get over you. Amen. you. You're not here to take anybody else's place. Right. You're here to do your thing. That God has called you to do. 
You know, jealousy comes in in churches, doesn't it? Look at 1 Samuel 18. Whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. So Saul made him a commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. When the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistines, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. This made Saul very angry. What's this, he said. They credit David with ten thousand and me only with thousands. Next they'll be making him their king. Right on, Saul. <laughs> so from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Mm-hmm, I bet he did. Now, jealousy is a sin nobody wants to talk about. Yes, it's, it's evil in God's sight because friendship, it destroys friendships and it destroys churches. Look at Galatians 6, 4. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. Amen. That's a good word. Amen. Number two, first was comparison. That weight, get rid of it. Number two, competition. What about it? It's often in the con. We think about it in context of sports. One team against another team. But in the body of Christ, we're one team. One body of Christ. When players on a sports team, they just start fighting for themselves, compete with each other. You know, the results are not very good. So there's no justification for competition in the church. None. We should not be competing against each other. Each one has your own race to run. You have to do what God's called you to do. You do it the best you can. Run your race. And the spirit of competition has absolutely no place in the church. Number three. Compromise. What about that weight of compromise? It trips you up in life right and left. The temptation to compromise is everywhere. You compromise your integrity for the sake of gain or influence. A little bit more money. Somebody laugh at you a little more, love you a little more, like you a little more. You can get a better position. It's abhorrent in the sight of God. Psalm 119 says, Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil, and they walk only in his paths. I mean, that's just three things. We could go on and on. Hebrews 12, it says, Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. The Bible says that faith is not enough Come on. Come to inherit the promises of God. Come on. Hebrews 6, 11 to 12. Our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and their endurance. You know, some of us just cringe at the word when you start talking about patience and endurance. So let's make it so we understand. The word means wait. <laughs> you got it? Yeah. Something's happening in here. There's something going on. Where was I? Oh, okay. Wait. <laughs> Most of us are 10 steps or 50 steps ahead of the Lord. And we tell him to hurry up. You ever told the Lord to hurry up? Did you notice he didn't hurry up? <laughs> The Lord says, what's your hurry? And we, we say, 
Don't you understand, Lord? I need you to hurry up. And he keeps saying, you know, I'm not in any hurry. I, you know, I'm God. You quit trying to be God. Right. Quit trying to control everything. So if you hadn't settled it before, sell it today. To inherit the promises of God, you need faith to believe the promise and endurance to wait for its fulfillment. Amen. So let me give it to you. I know. To inherit the promises of God, you need faith to believe the promise. There is something going on over here. Hmm. To inherit the promises of God, you need faith to believe the promise and endurance to wait for its fulfillment. By faith and patience, we receive our inheritance. Amen. <laughs> You know, you and I don't want to hear anything about weight. We like apps. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever they are. <laughs> we, we do. We, we, like, we live in a generation of apps. There's an app for everything. And you like instant downloads. Like I'm trying to get one right now. <laughs> and I know some of you think I'm crazy. You think I care? <laughs> They've been thinking that for 38 years. I'll, get, I'll let you in on a little secret. They thought it before then. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're missing out on something. Now, but there is no app for patience. I just thought I'd tell you that. And there's no download for endurance. Amen. That's right. Maybe you're one of those people who don't like to go shopping. So you click on, you don't want to get out of your house. You want to shop. So you click on a button called Amazon. And you want to get it quickly. So you join Amazon Prime. <laughs> if it's not fast enough, Amazon now. I want it now. Anything that makes me wait, I've got to find an app that will give it to me faster. That's what most of us think. It's the same with texting. You know, you text somebody, they don't answer in 60 seconds. You're mad. <laughs> I'm telling you, that we, it, you can end friendships because they don't answer your texts. Y'all think that that's the truth because it took too long to reply. What were you doing? Who were you checking with? Where were you? Now, I'm not against technology. It's a great tool for spreading the gospel, but I do want you to understand something. There's no place from Genesis to Revelation uh, where a precedent that tells you that you step into your destiny overnight. Right. Right. And yes, you know, there are suddenlies, but if you read the Bible, most of the suddenlies took 20 years. <laughs> And so did yours. <laughs> you just thought it was suddenly. Right. That's right. That's right. But there's a suddenly coming. Amen. Now we've been waiting on it a long time. Amen. But it's going to be a suddenly. You know, so. But with endurance, there is no suddenly. Amen. Faith is not calling those things that are as though they are not. That's a lie. That's a denying reality. Uh -huh. Denying reality is not walking in faith. Faith is calling those things that are not as though they are. Yes. Yes. Declaring and decreeing according to the word of God that which is not yet visible to you right. in the natural. Right. But you know it in the spirit. Right. Yes. Yes. Now that's how God thinks. He sees you complete. He sees you perfectly whole. He has quite an imagination, doesn't he? 
Look at your neighbor. Ah, no, no. Well, here we go. Hallelujah. He sees the finished work when he looks at you. Amen. Who you're becoming. Amen. Even though you're not there yet. That's how he sees you. He sees you seated in heavenly places. Amen. Even though you're laid out on your bed. He sees you. Amen. He knows what he called you to be. Amen. And he sees you that way. So we need endurance to deal with reality on our way to the fullness of his promises. To endure is not passive, church. Training for endurance is to get you straightened, strengthened because our walk with the Lord is not a stroll in the park. It is a marathon. And for a marathon, you have to have endurance. You don't get stronger on last year's phase any more than a marathon gets stronger on last year's exercises. God's mercies are new every morning because every day, from God's point of view, is a brand new opportunity. Every day. I thank the Lord for what he did yesterday, last year, but today is today. And the Bible says in Hebrews 3.15, Hebrews 3.15. <laughs> Remember what it says. Today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. In plain English, don't live on stale bread. Amen. You know, if you leave a piece of bread out, it hardens by morning. Just leave it out. You may be 30, you may be 50, you may be 70, you may be 80. Whatever age you are, own it. Be grateful. Yes. Don't ever wish to go back. Why should you? The Bible says we grow from grace to grace and faith to faith. Why would I go back to the faith I had when I was 30? I couldn't believe for much. When I've grown from faith to faith, and glory to glory, and grace to grace, yes. over these next 40-something years. Why would I want to go back? I've learned a lot. Amen. At 50, I can be more diligent than I was at 20. At 60, I can be more compassionate than I was at 30. At 70, I can be more faithful than I was at 40. At 80, I'm something else. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that in. I can throw it in because we won't see it. I'm just telling you. I don't know about you, but I'd rather team up with Caleb and say, give me this mountain. I want to complete my race. I don't want to fall short. I've fallen short so many times, but the Lord picks us up and slaps us right back in the race. I want to finish my race. Tell your neighbor, I want to finish your race. I want to finish my race. Now, there's not anybody in here. You, everybody has their own race. I want to finish my race. Following Jesus really is simple. It's just not easy. <laughs> Crucifying the flesh is simple. Just not easy. Stripping off the weight is simple, just not easy. Running with endurance is simple, just not easy. There's a part that we play, it's called choice. Amen. If laziness is your problem, listen up. God's not going to download energy from heaven to get you off the couch. You have to get up and get to moving. If you're addicted to social media, if that's your problem, God's not going to reach down from heaven and turn off your laptop. <laughs> you have to turn it off. We want miracle deliverance. But laying aside what slows us down spiritually, we, we don't, we, it's not a miracle issue. Let me say that to you again. 
We want miracle deliverance, but laying aside what slows you down spiritually is not a miracle issue. It's a management issue. It's about you managing you. I'm going to give you three things you need to manage. First one's found in Romans 13, 11. This is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Amen. First thing you need to manage is your time. Second thing is found in Colossians 3.17. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Manage your walk with the Lord wisely. Amen. Number three, Proverbs 4.23. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Manage yourself wisely. Manage your time wisely. Manage your walk with God wisely. Manage yourself wisely. And here's the bottom line of what I'm saying. There are seasons of life. And in every season, there are different things that you and I are going to face and have to endure. Different circumstances that demand our patience. Patience assures that we will not miss God's blessings. Giving up assures you will. But waiting on God, the blessing is there. Some things that we're finding in the past season, they are not okay in this season. Everybody needs to hear me because we have a short season. Did you hear me? Seasons are about to change. They could change in a week. At the longest. Some friends you had in the past were just fine. But in this present season, they may be more of a weight than they are a blessing. Not everybody God brings into your life is meant to be in your life forever. Did you hear me? Don't be running with people who are not pressing in for the upward call of Christ Jesus. What will make the difference in the last day's church is this. Endurance steadfastness, faithfulness, and patience. Amen. Exercising your spiritual muscles in prayer and fasting, meditating on the Word, loving each other, forgiving each other, caring about each other, blessing those around you. If you want fresh olive oil, the olive has to endure the press. Amen. If you want fresh anointing, the flow in your life, you do, you got to endure God's press on your life. If you stop allowing God to press you and you rationalize what's happening to you and you decide, I'm going to jump ship, tired of this, you might want to talk to Jonah. Right. <laughs> it didn't work very good for him. For those of you who know your Bible. And you know, when somebody hurts us, we want to fix it immediately or eliminate it, run away from it, anything rather than endure it. We need to learn to let God turn pain into gain Amen. and to stop settling for a minimal spiritual experience. Amen. The only way you're going to run the race with endurance all the way to finish is by keeping your eyes on Jesus. That's the only way. It's simple, but it's not easy. God never promised us easy. But he did promise he would be with us always. And never forsake us that his grace is sufficient for all things. That he's given us everything we need for life and godliness. 
that he's preparing a place for us and he's putting the last little touches on it. Well, maybe that last touch is already on there. I needed to be corrected. The eye has not seen nor has ear heard the wonderful things he's preparing. Eternal life is already ours. That joy unspeakable and full of glory awaits for us. Fig tree generation, run the race. Carry your baton. Don't drop it. I'll close with this passage. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 7. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we've been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. Pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you and bless you and praise you. We magnify and glorify your name. You're worthy of all of our praise. Oh, Lord God. Imagine. We are the generation that will take a flight. We are the generation that will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. We are the generation that we hear Gabriel shout and the Father blow the trumpet. Come up higher. Come up higher. It's hard to comprehend, Lord. It's hard to process. But I know you're not a man that you should lie. And I know that all things come to an end. And I know that you deal with seasons and times. And I know you're a God of order. And I know even though it's beyond what I personally might can process, just as surely as the day came when you said to Noah, get in the boat. Or when you said, I'm shutting the door, the window. Just as surely as when we looked, Lord, and you sent the witnesses the angels to Lot and in less than 24 hours you said get out get out of this place just as surely as one day you sent the Babylonians or the Assyrians ahead of the Babylonians and you brought down 
the ten tribes and and you brought down the others and the temple that was so outstanding crashed to the ground just as surely as you your word came to pass just as surely on a certain day when Gabriel visited Mary or when Gabriel visited Zechariah first and then went to Mary. Just as surely as they were particular times, not happenstance, any of it, in the fullness of it, and it came to pass. You said a day was coming and you laid out clues all along the way. Clues that you have helped us to see. Clues that you said when certain things happen, other things will happen. And then you said that a shout would come and a trumpet would sound. And you said the dead in Christ would rise and those who are left here would meet them in the air. You said that was going to happen. You said all the things that will take place during tribulation. You said it was going to happen. You have told us that the waves of tribulation the tsunami of it now. It's all over the world. And those that have eyes to see and ears to hear can see the things that are set in motion that you said in Revelation would take place. They're already on the scene. All those tools are here. All those happenings are here. You said there'd be a false prophet. We know. You said there'd be an antichrist. We know. You said what to look for. You said what would be happening. We've been looking. We've been knowing. We still find it hard to believe we're it. Lord, speak to us in the night season. And Lord, I pray from the depths of my being. If there are things, I, I can only speak for me, and I can pray for everybody, but if there are things in my life that's not pleasing, or if there are things in people's lives here that are so displeasing to you, or if there are things, Lord, that we haven't repented of, or if there are things we need to make right, Lord, please show it to us. Not because you're going to beat us up. But Lord, you have such rewards and awards and you are a giver. And you have so much waiting for us. And most of us are people, if people want to give us something, we want to take it. And yet, here you are the giver of all gifts. And we step back as if it may not be true. Lord, forgive us for our lack of faith. Forgive us for questioning supernatural things. Forgive us for falling into that category of those who say, oh, they've been saying this for years. There she goes again. There is a day. There is a time. There is a season. It will happen. Help us to be ready whenever it happens. There are things we have planned in this next week, Father, that would not meet a godly criteria. 
give us courage to put it straight. There are things that you've told us to do and we've not done it, even with finances or whatever it might be. Help us. Help us. There are people we need to ask forgiveness of. Give us courage to be, have such integrity. Lord, forgive us for gossiping and murmuring and destroying your church that you died for. Forgive us. And Lord, as we come to the table, help us to remember that as we take of the bread, you promised healing. And we receive it by faith. And as we drink of the juice, the fruit of the vine, help us to remember, Lord, that sin cannot hide from the blood of Jesus. And whatever may have ever happened in our life, the blood of Jesus cleanses us and makes us pure. And we thank you for it. Lord, I ask today that it go deeper than it has ever gone. Help us to let go of what we've not been willing to let go of for the sake of the kingdom. Give us opportunity this week to share with somebody just simply that Jesus is coming and do you know him? Do you know him? He knows you. And I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I think you have your little cup with you. If you have your little cup, if you don't have one, would you slip your hand up? Anyone who doesn't have one, slip your hand up. We need one over here. On the front row over here. Anyone else? Lord, I believe. I want to thank you for what the healings that you've done and the miracles we've seen over the past weeks. And we thank you that we can come and eat, come and dine, and your miracle is pulsating through our bodies. In Jesus' name. And we will boldly say to hell and to Satan, you are a liar and a loser. And every sin that we've ever committed in our lives has been covered by the blood of Jesus. And we thank you for it. And we drink this morning remembering the goodness of God. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Before we go, if there's anyone here, and there's any kind of question in your life about whether or not you know Jesus or not. Would you slip your hand up and let me introduce you to him? I'm not talking, the church can't save you. I'm talking about you. Anyone. 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 If you're watching out there, please invite Jesus into your life. He knows you. He isn't mad. He loves you and wants you to come home to him. He's prepared a place for you. And he went to the cross of Calvary and died in your place. Rose up out of the grave. He's alive forevermore. Seated at the right hand of the Father. Warning you to invite him into your life. By opening your heart. Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. 
I need you, I want you, I invite you into my life. Come change, rearrange me. I give me to you today. In Jesus' name. You pray that prayer. Please let us know. Please let us know. Hallelujah. Someone coming to the Lord. Praise God. Someone can help us. Cordelia, you coming, Miss Cordelia? Right over here. Right over here. Wonderful. Wonderful. Do y'all know the Lord? Yes. Y'all already know him. You want to join the church. Hallelujah. Praise God. They want to join. Glory. Hang on. Is there anyone else? Miss Cordy, someone, whoever's coming. Come. Anyone else want to come join? Come on. Maybe your last time. Maybe it. Anyone else? Come on. Come on. Come on. church and be a part of who we are. Come on. Come on. Anyone else? Come on. You got any kind of want to in you? Come on. We'll wait on you. Come on. Come on. We're waiting on you. Come on. Anyone else? Anyone else? Might be the last time for us. Come on. Amen. Get right on down there. Come on. Anyone else? Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. Anyone else? Come on. I'm going to say this one more time because the Lord said there are people here and you think, ah, I don't know, I don't know. Come on. Don't sit there. Come on. If ever you're going to come, come now. Any kind of want to, come while the want to is there. Come while the want to is there. Because the devil will take it in a minute. Just step out and you'll be amazed. Come on, anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Glory, glory. Glory, glory, glory. Turn around and take some now. Let me see who we are. All right, you may be seated, congregation. Now, Lord just said there was somebody else over here in this area that, that in your heart you think you want to come, but you're just kind of a little nervous about it. And there's someone right back over here somewhere. You know, but just do whatever you want to. I'm just telling you. I just heard it. So, anybody, get up and come. Just come on. Don't be ashamed or embarrassed about it. Just come on. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? All right. Tell us who you are. My name is Alberta Wilson Jones. We're so glad you're here. I know you love the Lord. Yes, I do. He came into my heart. I was sitting on my sunroom porch and I said, Lord Jesus, if you for real, let me know who you are. Because I was in a different organization and I didn't know who he really was. But you know him now. Yes, I do. Hallelujah. Now, Miss Shirley Abram. Macon, Georgia, but I, we just recently moved down here, and uh, I was trying to find a church home. I told my husband, I said, let's go to Pastor Sanders, Miss Kennedy Church. I said, no, we're just a good church, and I like the way she preached, and it touches my heart, and I want to go to Georgia's church. It's Christian Spirits. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Mr. Abram. I'm coming at Christian Spirits. Amen. The devil's under your feet. You born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb? You know Jesus? Yes, All right. Hallelujah. Yes, my name is Jeannie Chirac. I relocated back to Augusta from Newport News, Virginia. I was 
at Mercy and Truth Ministry, and I was one of the ministers there. Wonderful. We're delighted to have you here. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Roz Thomas, and I'm joining today. Wonderful. Yeah. We're so happy to have you. My name is Lisa Thwaite, and I'm joining today. I am so glad, Lisa. So glad. My name is Donna Bailey, and I'm Caroline's cousin. Everybody knows me. Well, we're delighted. We're delighted. God bless you. My name is Joyce Blanding, and I need a covering. So Amen. I'm joining Joyce, today. we're so glad. Thank you. I'm Lisa Williams. I'm joining today. Glory to God. I'm so glad. So glad. Um, my name is Ariel Johnson. It's been um, a couple of years since we've been here. And so me and my, my, me and my grandma and my family just came back after so many years. And so I'm thankful. Give me some sound. Um, and we've, we've been gone away, but we came back to the church some months ago. And so I'm trying to get our relationship right with the Lord. Praise God, honey. It's a good day to come. I'm Gloria Pereira, and um, I got saved. Oh I thought you were already a member, glory to be honest. I am, but I'm up here anyway. <laughs> well, hallelujah. But you're a member, glory to God. <laughs> hallelujah, she's a member already. <laughs> Come on, let me. Now, normally, I don't know, we go on a regular routine. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. So they're going to take you back. And uh, the good loves, where are they? I don't even see them. Okay. The good loves are going to take you back. The Reverend, Reverend good loves are going to take you back. Come that way with them. Now there, you don't have, you know, there's not gonna, they're not going to keep you long, but there's a class that we go through, and they'll tell you all about it and work with you. Come on, church, stand your feet and thank the good Lord for this today. Hallelujah. Praise your Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Well, did you learn anything today? I'm telling you. Well, what's happened in Israel? They hadn't voted yet? <laughs> well, my goodness, I'd be paying attention if I were you, because every minute of every day that goes by speaks something new and something different to us, because when whomever it is, whenever they go in, 59, it does have a great meaning in our life, and that's the truth. So I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I have no earthly idea. I do know this. Jesus is coming. And I know he's coming very, very soon. And I know we are to keep our eyes on the eastern sky. Amen. Have I told you lately I love you? I love you dearly. You are the most wonderful people in the world. I'm so thankful God has allowed me the great privilege to pastor you all these years. I thank you. Hope you'll be with us tomorrow night. Who knows? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stand while we put the rod back in its little ark. the rod we thank God and we praise him we praise him in Jesus name hallelujah Michelle would you come closest in prayer please I want to personally thank you for praying so for Pat we almost lost her on several occasions but thank God she's had a turnaround hallelujah, hallelujah. and I look hallelujah. forward to seeing all of you tomorrow night. Amen. God bless you. We love you. We love you, Pastor. God bless. Hallelujah. Father, what a privilege and an honor to be in your house today, Father, in this season. Father, that we find ourselves in, Father, watching, Father, your hand at work all around us, all around the world. Father, let us have ears to hear. Father, what the Spirit would tell us to do every day, Father, from getting ourselves right before you, Father, to telling as many people as we can that you're coming and about who you are. Father, it's a privilege and an honor, Father, to be on the earth in this season as we help usher in your return. What an assignment 
Father, on our lives individually, Father, corporately as a body of Christ here at Whole Life. Father, we thank you. And Father, I speak the blessing, your blessing over the people who are in the house today, those who are watching online. Father, I thank you, Father, as we go forth, Father, that your favor rests upon us. Father, that you put opportunities in front of us, Father, for us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, that you would allow us, Father, to be a light in the darkness, to bring hope to the hopeless. Father, that you would so talk to us in the upcoming days, Father, that we hear you clearly and accurately. Father, we hear you easily. Father, we hear you quickly. Father, we know we're not supposed we pray for patience, Lord. Help us to learn to wait on you. Let us not get before you. Let us not get behind you, Father. Let us walk with you. And Father, we thank you. We thank you. Keep everyone safe as they go, Father. We thank you for, for bringing everyone back, Father, safely to this house, Father. See them here, see them there, Father. We're looking forward to it either way. Father, we bless you. We thank you. It's been a privilege to be in your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.